Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at some of the primary navigation systems for instrument purposes on the DCS-MI8. Now, you're probably going, well, where's this coming from? Well, way, way back in the day, you know, one of the first videos I ever did on my channel was showing you how the NCNS system works on a Tupolev 154, as well as on an AN24. So it was actually pretty cool when I found out that the MI8 actually has that feature built right into it, which is down here. Keep in mind, it is a simplified version of the same exact system, but it actually works fairly well and it works basically the same. In a lot of ways, this is actually an easier way to learn this particular system. So uh, the other system we'll be looking at today is going to be the ADF. We have an ADF. We actually have two different types of ADF on the MI8. We have this one on the left, which is a pretty conventional one. You'll probably recognize this as an arc compass. This is the old school one. Now on the right, we actually have a really, really slick system that we can use in order to do search and rescue discoveries and stuff along those lines. So these both work very, very well for this purpose. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started so we can go ahead and take a look at things and get rolling. So I usually like to start from the middle seat, as crazy as that sounds. The reason being is the fact that it's a little bit easier to see some of the control panels when you do it from the middle seat. Let's go ahead and get rid of that other pilot. So first thing I want to do is I'm going to get my batteries working. Next, I'm going to go ahead and flick on on my generators. We have generators one, two. We also have the two of these. These are inverter systems. You want to make sure that they're working. I'm going to go ahead and turn on some general lights as well as my navigation lights to get everybody sort of heads up. Anti-collision light gets turned on as well. And I'm going to go ahead and focus right back in the center of this aircraft. Looking up at the top, we have all the circuit breakers. I'm actually just going to flick them all on. I know we can be very, very precise about selecting only the ones we absolutely need, but I'm not going to do that. Obviously, I'm going to skip all the armament panel. We just don't need those. Next, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the fuel systems. This is pretty simple in this particular helicopter. I'm going to go ahead and flip these three on. We'll go take a look at the APU. Again, this is the same style system that we had on the N24. All you have to do is come over here and press the start button, and that's it, and it just starts itself up. While that system is starting up, I'm going to go flip over here real quick. I'm actually going to turn on both of my fuel. Most people would say, why would you turn on the fuel before you turn the engines on? Well, it really doesn't matter in this particular helicopter because of the fact that the way the system is set up is that it's going to work either way. It actually won't introduce fuel until things are actually safe. Coming up on the top right, I see that I've got myself enough air pressure for a good start here. Fuel is turned on. We want to go ahead and shut off the rotor brake, which is going to be right in the middle. If you don't do that, you will not be able to start. Now, what makes this helicopter a little different, too, is the APU does not provide electric power. So we're going to need to get those engines started up before we can get too crazy here. Select my right engine, set it to the start position, go ahead and press the start button. That's all you have to do. There's not a lot more complicated. One thing I will double check real quickly is to see that my parking brake is set. Now I'm lucky that my joystick actually has one of these little flippy things in the front so you can actually lock the brake out by hand. It's extremely satisfying as you could probably imagine. All right, I'm seeing the rotor blades turn, looking down here. I see that I've got a good light off. We're not hitting any critical temperatures or anything like that right now, which is awesome. And we're just gonna let the thing take a couple moments to go ahead and get itself all warmed up. Taking a look up at the tippy top again. Auto ignition still on. You can see that the air pressure from the APU has actually dropped. Normally when you start engines on a helicopter, you always start the one that's towards the wind, or you start the one that is uh, basically not been started first last time to try to get even wear on either one of the different systems. But in this case, I'm just gonna start it. Again, this is kind of a quick start as it is. Looks like our main hydraulic system is on. Now that that's all set, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my warning system, which is probably gonna give me about a thousand warnings, nothing there with there, and off it goes. Now that that engine started, I'm gonna flip to the other one, go ahead and press the auto start button on that, and we're gonna get this thing rolling right away. Yeah, I imagine she's pretty grumpy right now. Taking a look over here, make sure we get a good light off. Yep, there it goes. You can see my RPM's coming up, it's about 22% right now, which is actually not too, too bad. Once this thing gets started, we can start concentrating on our ADF as well as our NCNS slash Doppler navigation system. I'm just going to give everybody a moment to kind of get all charged up here. Looking pretty good so far. Wait for that starter to cut out. It only takes a moment on this helicopter. It's not too bad at all. Looking pretty good. All right, I think we are good. All right, starting procedure is complete. We also can confirm that because when we look up at the tippy top here, we can see that our air pressure is starting to come back up again as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and flip over to my right. I'm going to turn on my rectifiers. I'm going to go ahead and slowly increase RPM just a teeny tiny bit. I'm doing this over here on the collective. Once we get it powerful enough, the generator warning should cut out. There it goes. 
and we are good to go. Let's go ahead and shut the APU off. And that's it. Set it back to crank. And now it's time to take a look at the navigation systems. Oy. So the first one we're going to be looking at is going to be the good old fashioned ARC ADF system. This is actually really, really easy to use in this particular one. It's the exact same uh, radio compass that you've probably seen in other games or other simulators like it. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to flip it to the comp position. Next one I'm going to do is I'm actually going to shift my head to the right a little bit. So now this is the main one that we're going to be listening to channel wise. And this is the reserve one that we're going to be listening to for backup. You can actually switch between these. To switch between them, you're just going to come down here and there's this little BA switch. Right now it's set to B, which is reserve. If you click this switch, it would be using this one. So let's go ahead and take a look. We're going to be flying today over to Siri Island, which happens to have an NDB at it with a frequency of 300. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first adjust this handle, snap it to 0, zero then I'm going to attach the big handle to flap it to 300. Go ahead and do the same thing on this one, and now we're good to go. Our ADF is now all set. As a matter of fact, if we look down here, you can actually see this needle is now pointing in the direction of that ADF station. Now, one of the things I really, really like about this particular simulator over X-Plane is this needle is very unreliable, and you'll see that during the flight, which makes it a little bit more exciting. Now that that's going, I'm going to start getting our Doppler navigation unit all ready to go. So to do that, I'm going to swing up here, go ahead and turn some things on. Looks pretty good. Switch to the other side. I'm going to go ahead and flip on a couple things here, too. All right, looking pretty good so far. I'm going to go ahead and look towards back towards the center here. Switch back to the flight engineer. See, I just think it's amazing to have a flight engineer on a helicopter. I'm going to go ahead and turn on this autopilot channel. It's going to make our lives a little bit simpler. Okay, so now we have provided power to our Doppler navigation unit. First things first, make sure that you realize the difference between a magnetic and a true heading. This little device up here will allow you to dial in whether you want a magnetic compass heading, which is adjusted by latitude, by the way. If you want a gyro compass heading, or I believe this is astral compass, if I recall correctly, we don't have that capability. Luckily for us, that this latitude was actually set correctly when the flight simulator first started up. Matter of fact, if I just take a quick look at it right now, you can see that it's about 2552. It's about 20, almost about 26. That's perfectly set up. And it's set to MC which means our Doppler unit will be using magnetic compass headings for calculations. People who remember my tutorial way, way back for the Tupolev 154 and the N24, remember it usually used true headings. If you want to use true headings, you'd have to actually slap this to GC and then manually adjust it so that it works. In this case, I'm just gonna trust that the system works. All right, so next thing we wanna do, first thing I'm gonna do is flip this over to the test position. I'm gonna make sure this is working correctly. Now it's time to set up our core. So to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back on our big map here. I'm going to go ahead and grab my tool here. I'm going to go ahead and measure this angle. This looks like it is 275 for 26, 27 nautical miles. So first thing I'm going to do is dial in that 275. Again, this is the direction we're going to be heading in. I like how it accelerates. This can be super tricky on some other aircraft. Okay, looks pretty good. We can actually get much more precise than that if we needed to. And now distance. Now this is where people get confused. This is first of all in kilometers. Second of all, you're going to see this thing. This is forward. So what we're going to do is actually offset this to our current position. What does that mean? Well, if you remember, this was about 26 nautical miles away. 26 nautical miles away is about 52 kilometers away. So what we could do is leave this at zero, fly towards the target, and this would tick down all the way to zero, or up, tick up, I should say, to 52. Or what we can do is you can offset it negatively by 52, representing that this is our current position, and then flying to try to get that needle to go back down to zero. Now you're probably sitting there going, okay. Let's go ahead and clip that all the way there. And now we are good to go. I'm not actually gonna flip it on until we get into position. I'm gonna flip this to the OPER position and I'm gonna leave it on land. All right, I think we're in actually pretty good shape to actually get this flight going. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and I'll reset this to total. Now let's go ahead and call them up and say that it's time for takeoff. We're gonna go switch to our JADRO. Flip that one on right there. I'm gonna come down here. I believe it's 395. Let me try to take a look real quick. Uh, 395. So we'll set this to 395. This is an HF radio, in case you're curious. Let's go ahead and call up air traffic control and say, hey, can we start up? Sapushk. 
Nice. Okay, we've got quite a bit of wind today. Now, one thing to note is that you don't see a dedicated instrument for the Doppler navigation system here. You have to actually do a lot of this by feel. I like this instrument as a reference, but realistically, this is going to be the most important number for us. The other thing I want to do is go up to my HSI. Let's go ahead and request taxi to runway. And I'm actually going to set my HSI to that 275 degrees. No coincidence, it's pointing to where the ADF station is as well. Again, what'd you expect? All right, so that's set, that's set, that's set, that's set. Let's switch back to the pilot seat. We're actually going to be flying this from over on the other side of the helicopter today. Go ahead and set that to 275 as well. And now we're looking like we are in very, very good shape. Let's go ahead and head over to the runway and go ahead and take off. Now, I love this thing because it's got those really classic squeaky brakes, you know, pneumatic brakes. All right, looks pretty good. There's our runway. Whoa! I love a helicopter that you can taxi with wheels. That's so pleasant. Look at this thing. It's like a race car. All right, get us all lined up. We're not going to turn on the calculator for the Doppler navigation unit until we get to the runway because uh, we want to make sure that it calculates properly. We're going to have a nice little complication as well. I'm going to go ahead and request uh, takeoff here. Man, do you have to hit the brakes hard on this thing. Wow. Line ourselves up neat and move the runway. I could probably let the weather vane effect literally carry me all the way around here if I wanted to. Looking pretty good. Ooh. All right, I'm clear to take off when ready. We're going to be traveling at about 60 meters today, which is about 200 feet for those who keep in score. Now I'm going to go over to my top of the navigation unit, and I'm going to press the on button. If it says enable, yeah, it's half of the fun. You also want to look behind your head and make sure that this is OPER. If it does not say OPER, that means it is not calculating. Also, double check to make sure that this is set to the OPER position, and then it's set to the correct land type. Right now we're over land. We're going to have to flip it to C in about two minutes. All right, we are clear for takeoff. I'm going to go ahead and release my brakes. Go ahead and push the controller forward just a teeny tiny bit. There's quite a bit of wind today, so a little bit of right foot, and we are airborne, just like that. Delightful. Okay, so now that we're airborne, you can see immediately that we're starting to show a speed as well as a drift angle. This drift angle is only showing us the angle of the nose relative to where we're traveling on the ground. So as you can look from me pointing to the right here, we're actually traveling in this direction. That's the only thing this tool will show you. So you have to kind of watch out for that. You have to do a lot of this by hand. So I'm going to go ahead and line myself up with the ocean, and I'm going to flip the Doppler system to ocean mode or sea mode. If you do not do this, your speed calculation will be garbage. So it's really important that you do that step. Okay, now we're good to go. So now what do we need to pay attention to as we're attempting to navigate using this tool? Well, the first thing we want to do is see what our offset is. In this case, you can see we're right about zero kilometers, which makes sense. We just got started on this journey. So I don't expect us to be, oh, look at the ADF needle freaking out. Nothing unusual with that, by the way. So now that I'm flying towards my destination, you can see that the distance of you know, ladder, longitude, I should say, is decreasing. You can see we've got about 46 kilometers on, yeah, away. On the top one where it says drift angle in kilometers, it's about zero, which is a good thing. It also says 0 0.5 left. That means that where we need to be is actually over here, which means if we need to correct for that, we'd have to turn the other way. But keep in mind, there's a significant amount of wind today, so that's going to impact that. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually let this kind of travel for a while and then see how much drift I accumulate. Obviously, the greater left and right drift, the further off course you're going to be. Now, for those of you who remember the AN-24 and the Tupolev-154 over in X-Plane land, or FSX, I think they actually had a really good model as well, you'll probably remember the experience of uh, trying to get that thing all synchronized with the autopilot. Well, we do have an autopilot on this thing, but it does not work for that purposes. I'm actually going to drift to my right just a teeny tiny bit. All right, looking pretty sweet, actually. I'm going to come a little bit more to my left. So you can see right now that I've accumulated about one kilometer to my left of drifting error, which does not surprise me in the slightest. So how do we correct for that drifting error? Well, let's think about it for a second. That says that where I need to be is one kilometer over on my left. And you can see right now that I'm pointing slightly towards my right. So do you see that needle getting bigger or smaller? Let me go ahead and speed up time a little bit so you can see it. You can see it remaining exactly the same. Now you're probably sitting there going, wait, what? 
Well, the reality is, instead of being perfectly on the course that we selected for ourselves, we're actually flying exactly half a kilometer offset to it. And because of that, and because we're automatically correcting for the wind properly, we're actually showing no increase or decrease in drift, even though we're not facing the direction that we actually need to be, quote, going in in order to get to our destination. So again, that's just kind of a neat trick. Now you can pre-calculate that if you're into those kind of things. You can see I've got about 38 kilometers to go. Now this particular system works really, really, really well if you're over land as well. As a matter of fact, it works better over land than it does over water because Doppler radar beams don't like waves. All right, speed up time a little more. Oh yeah, now not only do you have to be smooth at normal speed, you have to be extra smooth. All right, you can see my offset. I'm still about a half a kilometer left of where I need to be. Actually, the thing course itself is to my left. All right, so now if you look really carefully, you can see I'm exactly on the correct course. But remember, I've been drifting to the right. So what I need to do now is actually bring the helicopter to the left in order to correct for what's gonna be coming up in just a second. Go ahead and straighten my helicopter back out again. And now we're at a 275 heading. We're perfectly on course. And we have about, I think that's 28 kilometers to go right now. So I'm going to keep an eye on. This is not the greatest day to fly. It's something I find myself saying in the real world, unfortunately, much more than I'd like to. Speed up time a little bit. Now you can see I am perfectly, perfectly, perfectly on course right now. As a matter of fact, if I were to switch to the main view, let me zoom out just a teeny tiny bit, you can see I'm literally flying the course we just invented a few minutes ago, almost exactly. We're actually going to start drifting again because I'm not paying attention. Yep, I hear you, radar altimeter. I know I got greater than 200 feet. So what are some fun uses for this technology? Well, first of all, if you don't have a GPS, there actually is a GPS add-on for this, which works really, really well. This is a great way to get places without letting anybody know, or and plus, they can't jam you. Speed up time again. I am perfectly on course. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna start drifting in the other direction if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I've got it pretty much perfect. Yep, starting to drift. All right, I'm going to bring myself back this way. You can see I've got about 17 kilometers to go. Visibility is not terribly good today, so there's nothing new there. Now, if you really want to blow your mind, change the map angle at any time. It will cause all sorts of numeric trouble for you because it's going to try to recalculate where you are currently based on what you've just dialed in. Speed up time a little bit here. You can see now that I'm pointing to the right, I'm able to recenter on that course. Now I'm going to swing myself back to the left. And now I should be in much, much better shape and much, much closer to the intended course that I should be traveling on right now. All right, looks pretty good. Uh, I'm going to do a teeny tiny bit. Now, some of you are probably going, what are those little indications on the drift angle? Well, this is the drift angle relative to where we are versus where we're on the ground. Right now, our current drift angle is zero, even though we have a crosswind. And the reason for that is I'm using my feet to keep us straight. This little guy down here tells us what our current speed is, true speed, now keep in mind that's modified by however reliable our Doppler signal is over the ground, which is actually very, very useful because if there are strong winds, that's always going to give you a slick way to see how fast you're going. All right, we're now perfectly back on 275, as you can see. You can see we've got about nine kilometers to go. So pretty darn soon, we should be seeing that other island. Keep in mind, this is not inertial. This is completely based on radar reflections off the ocean, which is going to be highly unreliable. So we probably are going to end up being a little bit off from where we intend to be, but that is not unusual. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, that's part of the charm. You can see now we're actually drifting in the other direction. I'm gonna bring ourselves back to the center a little bit here. Now, sharp eye viewers will probably notice that ADF needle that we dialed in a little while ago is pointing a little off to my left now versus where it was earlier. Now, you're probably sitting there going, uh, does that mean we got lost? Are we gonna miss the island? Probably not on account of the fact I can actually see the island up ahead. And the second of all, that's because the ADF station itself is not at the airport. It's actually in the southern part of the island itself. So as a result, it's going to give us a funky heading. All right, we're perfectly on course once again. You can see I've got about six kilometers to go before I get to my destination. Now, if we did this perfectly, hypothetically, we should be somewhere around the middle of the airport itself. Now, I'm kind of crossing my fingers here that that's going to be the case because, you know, I've been known to disappoint myself from time to time. Bring myself a little bit more to the right here. Looks pretty good. At any point, I could have used the autopilot to help straighten me out a bit, but this is just kind of fun. Switching to land mode. That's all you had to do. 
And you can see my speed did not change very much, which is actually a good thing. Swing myself back to the left just a little bit. I got about four kilometers. Everything's gonna get very sensitive. It's just like approaching an ADF station kind of a deal. All right, we got about three kilometers to go. About two kilometers to go. And if you're pretty sharp eyed, you'd probably observe that the airport runway center is actually right over there. Now, why was that the case? Well, the reality was that because of the fact that we're going over water, we're not going to have a reliable signal. The other thing off, if you want to think about your actual lateral drift and stuff like that, there's quite a bit of it. Now, if we were over a perfectly nice and rocky ground or something like that, this would work very reliable. Another thing I want to give you guys a quick heads up. If I tilt the helicopter, do you see that green light that just popped on down at the display? That tells me that we're going on memory mode, which means you are not reliably reading how fast you're going over the ground any longer. It's really, really important that you watch out for tilting the helicopter too much, otherwise you will get a bad reading which will throw you off. That actually worked pretty darn well if you ask me, and you can see my ADF is pointing right where we were earlier. All right, let's go ahead and bring this thing on down now. Keep in mind the wind today is coming out of the west, so we actually have to turn the helicopter around to land into it safely. You never want to land away from the wind if you can help it, on account of the fact when you do that, you are very likely to get yourself into a vortex ring state, which is going to make you fall right out of the sky. Not the most pleasant experience, if you ask me. Other than that, this helicopter is kind of nice. I only wish that the Huey had things that much fun on here. So as usual, I hope this uh, tutorial slash video was kind of helpful for you guys. You know, it's kind of nice to go fire up DCS and kind of help people out. A couple of people are asking that kind of question. And again, there's nothing stopping you from using the, you know, G the GPS system if you wanted to, or just using, you know, the F10 map or anything along those lines. But for those of you looking for a slightly more authentic experience, that's a really, really cool way to do it. And again, most of you are already familiar with ADF as it is. Go ahead and put myself a little bit in the nose. We're starting to get that vortex a little bit. Nice. Swing myself around nice and gently. Say hello to the tower. Hello to the tower. Okay, hopefully this was helpful. Again, it's a throwback. I'll hopefully we see other things like this. If you have any other navigation topics that you're confused with, I could probably help out just a little bit. Otherwise, enjoy. Wee!